Welcome to the webinar, build your own customized carrier board, it's easier than you think. My name is Peter Lischer, I'm a senior hardware development engineer here at Toradex HE in Switzerland. I'm in the hardware development team for computer modules. Next to me there is sitting Diego Petrarca, he is a hardware engineer as well. He is also working at Toradex AG in Switzerland and he is working in the development team for the evaluation boards and add-on accessories. He is our specialist for Altium designs, uh, so he will provide you all the information about Altium. First of all, in order to start, I would like to, to tell something about the whole webinar, how it will work. Uh, in the webinar tool you see there is a chat window, so if you have any question during the webinar feel free to add this uh, question into this chat window. We will try then to replay during the uh, presentation or at the end in the 15 minutes question and answer session. So just type in all the questions you have. To the agenda, what we are going to do today uh, I will give you a short introduction into Toradex and our products, then I will talk about our design flow uh, and where Toradex is able to help you by uh, designing your own carrier board. Then I will give you some hints how you can select the correct Toradex module for your project. We will then have a live demonstration of our pinout designer which is actually a tool to do the pin boxing for our modules. I will then hand over to Diego in order to give you uh, some more information to our Altium project and designs, including our libraries. At the end, I will have a short uh, talk about layouting. And as already mentioned, at the end, we will have a 15-minute question and answer session. So let's start with a short introduction of Toradex. Probably most of you guys already know Toradex, but I would like to present our company for the ones who are new to our company. Toradex was founded in 2003 in, uh, in Switzerland. We are based uh, in Horb, which is a suburb of Lucerne in the middle of Switzerland. Uh, it's still our headquarter here in Lucerne where we do most of the development work. We have now opened uh, a lot of offices around the world. So it started with Seattle in the USA, but we also have now offices in Brazil, Vietnam, India, China, Japan. So you should be able to get uh, Toradex people on the phone within your time zone. As you can also see in this slide, uh, Toradex products are used in many different applications. So all these kind of pictograms you see here, these are really applications in which Toradex products are used. So it's really widely spread, so we are in really a lot of markets. The main thing that we do at Toradex is developing and selling computer modules. A uh, computer module, in our case, uh, are ARM processor modules, which we, we have an ARM processor, or better called System on Chip, SOC, that is combined with flash, RAM, power supply, additional interfaces like Ethernet, etc. Uh, we also do the operating system optimization, so we provide uh, images for Windows CE as well as for uh, Linux. We do our in-house uh, optimization of these operating systems. The computer module is, not, is used together with uh, carrier boards. Uh, in this webinar, I try or we try to show you how you, you can easily build your own carrier board that uh, can be used with our Tardex modules in order to get together a successful product.
why should you use a computer module instead of doing uh, an SOC design uh, directly? So, uh, why shouldn't you do just a design in of a product? Or what are the advantages? Well, as you can see, uh, the latest SOCs, the latest ARM processors, they're getting quite complex when it comes to hardware design. So, it's not just the processor. You normally need also some RAM, which is, uh, can be, for example, a DDR3 RAM, which is uh, already quite difficult to root and to build. Uh, then, as well, you have the whole OS, operating system aspect. So, you need to have an operating system that works well with the hardware you have chosen. So, all this needs a lot of engineering effort. When using a computer module like the Tardex module, you can go faster to the market because you don't have to do all this kind of uh, development on your own. You also lower the risk because you're, you're basing on a computer module or on a system that is already tested in several systems, uh, which is working. So you don't have to do, do the whole procedure with uh, bring up and etc. And then another uh, advantage is the scalability. Uh, since you're using a computer module like the Tardex module, in which we have whole families with pin compatible modules, you can easy scale. So you can have a single core module used on your uh, hardware as well up to a quad core uh, without need to change a lot of things or you don't even need to change anything on your hardware. The second advantage is, can also be price-wise, because very often when you have just small value, volumes in your project, you will not get good prices for the SOC, for RAM, for flash, etc. Some vendors may not even will deliver to you if you have low quantity. So when you buy a computer module like the Tordex one, we can offer you all the price benefits we have selling a lot of volumes in this SOCs. Then another price uh, advantage is the, uh, the carrier board or the, the PCB that you, that you are building. For example, when you look at the module, when you have a DDR3 design on a module, it means that uh, you need to have a quite a complex PCB for that, uh, which is a HDI called multi-layer PCB. Uh, which can be quite expensive, and therefore you should keep these kind of PCBs as, uh, as small as possible. On the other hand, your carry board then, where you have all the big components on it, on your specific components, you can do it in a quite cheap PCB technology. So you can actually uh, save a lot of money by the PCB. And finally, uh, you also simplify your supply chain. You don't have to deal with all these uh, SOC manufacturers, with RAM, flash manufacturers, especially RAM and flash. These kind of devices are, can get quite uh, problematic when it comes to supply chains. Some of them change uh, dies in a yearly base. So when you use our module, we will deal about these kind of changes. We will do the adaptation integration into the latest version of the product. And you also have the way to an upgrade path, maybe for future uh, version of future uh, processors that are coming up. So much to the uh, to Tordex and our products. We are now going into the whole design flow when you're designing uh, a carrier board. In this slide here, I want to tell you uh, what are the basic uh, kind of steps when you do a hardware design and where actually Toradex is able to help you. So there are three main steps, which is the system design, which is mainly to select all the components, uh, which is uh, do pin boxing, uh, selecting the module, etc. Then we have the design, the, the, the capturing of the schematic, which uh, is obvious. You do the actual designing, and then at the end, the layout. 
So how can we help you? In the first, uh, in the first section, uh, we can help you uh, with our website, with our developer website as well, in which we have a lot of information available on our products. And we can also help you with our pinout designer. So the pinout designer is a really big help when it comes to the pinboxing of the product. Then during the schematic capture, we can help you with uh, carrier board design guides. We just released the new Colibri design guide and we still have, or we have since quite some time, the, also the Apalis design guide in which you find a lot of information about schematics, etc. Then we also provide you for free uh, the Altium project files of our carrier boards, so you can use them for start with. And then, of course, you find also a lot of information in the data sheets of our modules, how to use it. In the layout phase, we can help you with uh, a layout design guide, uh, which we also have updated in the last couple of days. So there you find a lot of information and a lot of hints to the layout. So now let us dig into these three parts a bit closer first of all into the system design. So when you have to do a system design with uh, Colibri or with uh, Toradex computer modules, you first have to decide whether you are going to use a Colibri or an Apalis module. Since we have currently these two families, I want shortly to explain what are the differences between these two families. Uh, first of all, the Colibri uh, family uh, is slightly smaller than the Apalis and the Colibri uh, is based on a 200 pin SODIM connector which is known from the uh, SODIM uh, memories while the Apalis is based on the MXM3 it's a graphic card connector which has 310 pins. With the Colibri modules we are able we are on the market since it's now about 10 years, so we have a wide bench of different processors available. It starts with Marvel, formerly Intel processors, the BXA processor lines. We also have the NVIDIA, uh, Tegra 2, as well as the Tegra 3 processors. Then uh, lately we have uh, added the IMX6 from Freescales. We have them as single as well as dual court variant. And since a couple, I think two years now, we provide the Vibrate from Freescale. Uh, we have it also in two different flavors. We have their single core as well as an asymmetric dual core version. On the other side, on the Apalis family, we are currently having just the NVIDIA T30, Tegra 3 processor as well as the IMX6 in the dual and quad-core variant. When it comes to interfaces, the Colibri and the Palis are somehow different. I mean, the Colibri is mainly focused on this uh, a standard uh, microcontroller uh, kind of interfaces like UART, I2C, PWM, SD cards, GPIOs, this kind of stuff. Uh, the Apalis still has this kind of interfaces, but it adds a lot of high-speed interfaces like PCI Express, SATA, HDMI, it has gigabit Ethernet instead of fast Ethernet, etc. And also for the Apalis, we added uh, a really good cooling solution, so we are able to use a cooling solution, while on the Colibri, it is mainly uh, used without uh, big cooling solutions, so more for low power devices. So at the end you have to decide between high speed and high performance on the Apalis while you have more variety on the Colibri and uh, slightly the lower end uh, processors there. As soon as we have selected the family, uh, you have to know which module you actually want to use, which computer module from Toradex you want to use. 
Uh, for this, we have uh, a product selector on our website. So on our website, you can easily compare different modules. You'll find all the information on the development, uh, developer center that we have. And of course, whenever you have any questions, get into contact with our support team. We are happy to help you in selecting the, the right module for your project. When you have selected the module, then comes very often uh, the pinboxing part. So you have actually to see how you can use the interfaces or how you can mux them according to your needs. Well, as long as you're using kind of the interfaces that we have on our evaluation board, it is recommended to use these ones because we call them kind of standard, which means we are trying to keep these interfaces compatible between different modules within the family. So whenever you need just these uh, uh, interfaces that we also provide on the carrier board, I recommend you to keep to this standard configuration. But very often you need additional pins or additional interfaces on your module. And in this case, you have to deal with the whole complexity of the pin muxing, which means you can have uh, one interface on several pins of your, of your module. Since this is quite complex, we have introduced uh, two months ago a powerful tool which is called the Pinout Designer. You can download this tool for free on our website and we are now going to have a little uh, uh, live session in which I try to explain you how you can use this tool. So I open up the tool. Uh, that's how it looks like. I just put it into full screen. Uh, yeah. First of all, what you have to do is to decide uh, whether you're using Colibri or Palis uh, family. So in this case, you're going to use a Colibri module. Now you can select which module you want to base uh, your carrier board design. Uh, you can even select multiple modules at once. So for our little example, I'm going to use the two Vibrates modules. I'm selecting the Vibrates via 50 as well as the 61. So actually you can use, uh, select both of them. Now it appeared here a little tree in which all the interfaces uh, are showing up. When doing the pin muxing, I recommend you to begin with the uh, interfaces that you have the least choices, which means, for example, the, the two vibrate modules, they both have just two Ethernet uh, interfaces. So if you want to use two Ethernet interfaces, you don't have a big choice. So you have to use these ones. So I recommend to start with these kind of interfaces. That's what we are actually also going to do now. So we open up the Ethernet part. You can see there are two Ethernet ports available on these modules. So I'm going to select first just the first Ethernet port. As you can see now on the right side, there appear now all the signals that are involved, including the pins, and as well as the original names, how you can find them in the data sheet of uh, Freescale in this case. It also looks like here we have some additional signals like the IEEE 5088 uh, timestamp functions that uh, for our example product, uh, project we don't want to use, so I just deselect these. I want to use also the second Ethernet port. As you can see, the second Ethernet port is only available as RMI interface, so I have to add a second file on our carrier boards then. So I'm going to select the signals here. I don't want to use again the IEEE 5088 signals, uh, but I already get some red here. Red means there is a conflict. As you can see on the right side, it tells me that the clock in is in conflict with the clock out because it actually uses uh, the same pin. So the pin can only be used once. 
In this case, it is quite simple uh, since uh, you can use the RMI either to be clocked from the module or put the clock back to the module, but not both at the same time. I recommend to use clock output of the module, so I just do select the clock input of the module. So we go now ahead and select some further uh, interfaces for our little project here. So we are going to use a CAN interface. We may want to use some SD card interface. I just grabbed the first one. I want to use uh, a touch interface, four wire resistive touch. I just grabbed this one. I want to use some UARTs. So I want to use some uh, three UARTs which are uh, having even handshake, hardware handshakes. So I'm going to select three of them. Uh, we're having again another uh, issue here. We'll deal with that later. And I want to have also maybe a fourth UART, let's say that this time just with, uh, without the hardware handshake. So I just pick these signals here. Uh, you may want to have additionally uh, applying a display. So I open up the LCD part. I can see I have one LCD interface. But if I open up this one, you can see that there are actually subgroups. The reason for that is that you can use the LCD display interface in different modes. You can use them uh, 24, 16, 18 bit. And in order to make it more clear, we have separated them. So in our little example, we want to use it as an 18 bit. So I just select this one, leave the others. We may want to have some analog headphone audio output. So I go here. Uh, you may see that uh, this part here is gray. Gray actually means that uh, this interface is not available on both uh, modules that I have selected. So I mean, anyway, I'm going to use it. And I will see immediately what it means here on the right side. So if, if I go up, I can see that actually the headphone output is missing on the VF50, which is absolutely true for the VF50. This one does not have a headphone or any audio. Uh, I may want to have also some GPIOs in my little project. As you can see, uh, when I open up the GPIO list, I already have some of them are yellow. Yellow means uh, this pin is actually already used, so I should not use it, otherwise it will get red. So I'm just using the other ones, so I'm going to use a couple of GPIOs. So now I'm done with my little uh, configuration for now. But I can see now on the bottom it tells me we have three conflicts, so which means we have three pins which are in conflict with other ones. So now we have to resolve these problems. So we open up, for example, first the Ethernet here to see where we have here problem with the RXD0. I'm open up here again to see how many pins we have or how many options we have. Well, actually, for the Ethernet, I only have pin 97 that we can use it. I see here that uh, this pin 97 is in conflict with the URTC RTS. So maybe we have a chance here to solve the problem. So we're going up down here. Uh, the URTC, open up the RTC and see, well, you're lucky. There is a section op second option to output this URC RTS, so we are just going to use the pin 94 uh, instead of 79. One uh, issue solved. Uh, we have another issue, as we can see here. Uh, we have an issue with the uh, SD card here, as you can see. Uh, these two pins of the SD card are in conflict. Uh, there is also not an option here, so we have to see where actually is the conflict. The conflict is with the UART D, RX and TX. We go down here and see where we have the conflict. Uh, yes, here we have it. Unfortunately, the UART D also does not have an option, so there's no way to resolve this problem here. So the only way to resolve this 
uh, using either another SD card or another UART. Uh, when we open up the SD card, it mm, does not look good. So maybe it's better to use a different uh, UART. So we are going to use this UART instead of this one. So we have resolved all the conflicts, uh, which is good for now. Uh, what else we have on the bottom here? Uh, we have some information that three pins are not compatible, which means uh, we have already seen that. These are the three pins up here. Uh, these are not compatible between both modules. And it tells me also here there are 17 pins right now I'm using which are not standard. As you told you before, we have this kind of standard configuration pins, uh, the ones we try to keep constant or uh, try to keep uh, within the module family. So it just tells you that 17 of these pins, uh, you have to be careful when using with a different module. We can also add here uh, some additional viewing. Uh, you can add, for example, the compute compatibility type uh, in order to see which one actually are the ones. Uh, as you can see here, the ones who are called standard uh, are the ones uh, that are fine, and the ones that are called possible are the ones which are possibly not compatible to other modules. But it's not a problem as long as you stay within these two uh, modules that we have selected. There's also the option to show some additional notes, uh, etc. What else you can do with this uh, tool is now to test your carrier board that you have designed with other modules. So I can add here, for example, an IMX6 additionally and see how compatible it will be. As you can see, the, most of the parts are compatible, but the IMX6 is, for example, not having the second Ethernet, which is completely true for this module, it simply does not have two Ethernet ports. So it is also a useful tool to uh, com uh, compare different modules. At the end, you can also export to Excel or save it to a file. Uh, that's so far everything I want to uh, tell about this tool. I will now hand over to Diego, which will uh, tell you more about our Altium uh, files we provide our Altium design. So I will hand over to Diego. Hello everybody and thanks to Peter for giving us a good overview of the Pinout Designer, a really powerful tool. Since the time is available is quite short, I cannot show you how to use Altium Designer. This is not the purpose of this webinar. What I can do is giving you some information about what are the instruments, what is the help we provide, and what are the benefits of using these files. Like this, the next time you will approach a carrier board design, you will know that on our developer website, there is something that can be helpful for you in this process. As Peter already mentioned, Toradex provides, for free, the design data of both Colibri and Apalis families carrier boards. In particular, it is possible to download the Altium project of the Colibri evaluation board. It is possible to download the complete design of the Iris and Viola carrier boards. Both these boards have been designed to work with all the modules belonging to the family modules. Colibri. For your reference, I added to this slide the direct link to the zip packages containing these designs. On the developer website, we will find also the design of the Apalis Evaluation Board and Xora Carrier Board, which are fully compatible with the Apalis family modules. In addition, you can also download the Altium data of the analog camera module, which is analog to digital camera converter, that can be connected to both Colibri and the Palis carrier boards. Todex provides also the Colibri HDMI adapter Altium project. This product can be used with the Colibri modules, which feature the HDMI interface through an additional FFC connector. By using these links, you will therefore download the exact project from which have been exported the manufacturing data 
currently used by our EMS to manufacture our carrier and evaluation boards. You can therefore download one of our projects and use it as a starting point or as a reference for your designs. Let's now try to identify the phases that are normally involved in a carrier board design project. One of the three phases is, uh, of course, the component selection. The component that you are selecting needs to have the required feature that you are looking for. It must, therefore, behave how you expect. The component needs to have the right ratings, the right tolerances to be placed and correctly operate in that specific part of the schematic. Since you want to make uh, your procurement team life easy, the part needs to be easily procurable and the price needs to be, of course, as low as possible. The best case scenario is when the components have also a second source that can be directly used as a, a drop-in replacement, which also means having a common footprint when this is possible. The components that are on our boards have been selected by following all these criteria. In particular, we have been using quite often the website siva.com. I would really recommend you to use it. It can provide many user useful information like historical stock levels, prices, distributor list, and so on. The next phase of a carrier board project is the schematic symbol design. When the component vendor does not provide the schematic symbol for Altium, you need to create it from scratch. You need, therefore, to add manually all the pins, and if you have done that already, you know that this can take some time, and uh, let me say it can be a bit boring. This phase is also quite uh, repetitive, and this normally means that it is, easy, it is easy to make mistakes here. In our design project packages, you will find also the complete schematic library file. We have been creating all the components used on our carrier boards. We have been filled up all the component properties. We have introduced the part number naming convention to clearly identify the parts and to make the POM clearly and easily understandable from our EMS. I think that a good hint for this phase is suggesting you to design the symbol in a way that explains the main characteristic and the main functionalities of the device. So, for example, if you are creating an analog switch symbol, showing the internal connection possibilities will make your schematic much more readable for the poor software guys that need to understand and write the software for it. Let's talk now about the next phase, which is the footprint component design. Also, this phase can be really long, and you will spend many hours adding the component footprint, all the pads, the seal screen, all the mechanical layers that you will use to generate the assembly drawing files. A footprint which contains errors can impede you to assemble the components on the PCB and therefore an error in the footprint library can be very serious. A similar situation can be therefore very expensive because it cannot be solved with a simple patch wire like in a, a schematic error. In our Altium design packages, you will find also the footprint library files. We have created, uh, of course, all the components. We added the 3D models of them. This model can be, for example, uh, used to to detect mechanical conflicts in tight and complicated designs. Using these libraries in your project will allow you to export directly from Altium the 3D step model of the carrier board without the need of any additional CAD. And uh, you need also to consider that the components contained in our libraries have been already checked for errors since we have actually manufactured the boards which are using these components. I have also here a small hint for, uh, for you. When you're adding a new footprint in the library, it is recommended to have one of our, your colleagues reviewing it. Normally, when somebody makes a mistake, he cannot easily recognize it, but uh, a colleague has more chances to be successful. Let's talk now about schematic capturing. 
when you have to capture a new schematic, having a reference, something that has been verified, is really useful and powerful. In our designs, you will find several circuits and solutions which are there to be used, modified, integrated in your schematic sheets. If you have been using the schematic edio of Altium, you know that it can be really painful when the grids are not properly and currently set up in the library and in the schematic files. It can make the schematic capturing difficult and slow. What's my input related to schematic capturing? I would recommend you to perform a good netlist review to avoid wrong or missing connection. We normally export a list of all the nets of the design and we carefully check all the connection one by one. It could happen, for example, that Altium shows graphically a connection on the schematic file, but this connection does not get translated into a real net. It can be really dangerous. As you can see on this slide, the Torlex carrier board are really differentiated in terms of available interfaces and having a complete schematic files will allow you to combine these features to obtain your customized carrier board. The last phase of the carrier board design is the, the PCB layout. Usually you start this phase by setting up all the PCB configurations. You define your PCB setup, the rules like clearance, trace width, spacing for differential pair, signal, signal classes, etc. Also this time, you will find our design helpful because you will have already all the configuration there, ready to be modified and reused. You will only need to change the values to adjust them according to your needs and your requirements. By opening a PCB design, you can easily see how the component placement has been done, especially for areas like DCDC, where the component placement is really important in order to prevent EMC issues. In addition, you will be able to analyze the routing solution we adopted. You will have a deep look on how we have actually routed the signals on the boards. It is quite useful to see how an interface should be routed, how the reference planes or, for example, stitching bias or ESD protection diodes have been positioned and connected to the PCB. I have also here an hint for you. I would recommend doing a really good review of the Gerber file using a separate and external Gerber viewer. Usually we use GC preview for this task. I have also added the link of this tool on the slide. Like this, you will check what has been actually exporting for Altium. You will review one more time the data that will be sent to the PCB manufacturer, the data from which your board will be built. So, we have been talking about PCB characteristics and in this slide, I would like to show some of these aspects for our Apalis boards. As previously mentioned, the Apalis module features many high-speed interfaces like SATA, PCI Express, USB Super, USB Super Speed, Gigabit Ethernet, which are normally tricky to be routed. In particular, the Apalis Evaluation Board, which is our development and evaluation kits, has the highest number of interfaces. Despite this fact and the many components assembled on the board, a four-layer stack-up has been used to complete the layout. One of the reasons for what this has been possible is because the Apalis evaluation board is quite big. The area available on this PCB was enough to route all the signals mainly on top and bottom layer. In other words, the component density on this board was quite low. The direct breakout featured by the Apalis family also helped a lot here, I have to say that. On carrier boards like Xora or Iris, the area available was low, lower. And because of this, two additional layers have been added to the stack up and they have been used to route some of the signals. This means that we have for these carrier boards a total of six layers. On Xora we even used all four or two components. The space there was re definitely really tight. Anyway, as previously mentioned from Peter, the technology used on in our and hopefully on your carrier boards are pretty standard and normally relatively inexpensive. We take care about the complexity in the module's PCB. 
and this is one of the benefits of the module approach we provide. Our Altium project can be used as an example, as a good starting point, which will allow you to save a lot of time to reduce the risk of a product redesign and therefore to lower down the final cost of your carrier board. I will now give back the word to my colleague Peter and we'll talk a bit more about the layout. Thank you, Diego, for uh, some additional information to our Altium design files that we provide. I will go now on with uh, some layout guidelines since we are uh, running out of time uh, and we can only scratch on the surface of layouting. Uh, anyway, you find all the information and a lot more uh, at uh, Toradex Layout Design Guide, which you can download. When it comes to layouting, you probably are aware that uh, high-speed interfaces like PCI Express, SATA, HDMI, USB 3, etc. require special attention. But you should also be aware that some lower speed uh, signals should be routed properly. You can uh, reduce a lot of EMC problems by routing also lower speed interfaces, especially parallel uh, signals like the uh, LCD, parallel LCD or camera interface. So therefore, you should also pay attention when you do just a Colibri design with some low speed signals. What I normally do when I do uh, a layouting or routing, I keep kind of a list of the priority or the problema of the problematic uh, signals in mind. It is just an idea to know how, uh, which uh, interfaces are more delicate uh, and need more attention to root. For example, it is obvious that the PCI Express or a USB 3, which is actually PCI Express, requires a lot more attention than uh, an SD card interface which is running on a lower speed. So having this kind of priority is also good when you start with layout. It makes sense to start with the ones that are the most problematic one because then you still have a lot of room to route them properly, not, not needing to cross a lot of other signals. Uh, what you can find in our design guide is to each of these interfaces that we are having on our Colibri on the Palis modules uh, some additional information. This can be very useful when you do layouting in order to get to get a feeling how 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 much you should care take care of layouting a certain signal. I have had it here uh, a little table of in, uh, of information that you actually find in our design guide and I'm comparing here the PCI Express to the SD card interface. The first things that you can directly see is that the frequency is much different between these interfaces. USB uh, PCI Express can go up to 4 gigahertz when it comes to the latest generation. Uh, but you can also already see that it depends on the generation you're using. Uh, PCI Express. So a generation 1 can be less uh, delicate to root than a generation 3, which is way faster. The same is true for the SD card. Uh, most of our modules are providing right now just up to high speed SD card 50 megahertz interface right now. So uh, you have to know what actually is the speed that you have. Maybe some modules even have a lower uh, speed of the SD card. So there is even less care that you have to take. So you should know the frequency of the signal. Another really important thing is the impedance. Especially for PCI Express and other high-speed interfaces, uh, you have to keep a proper impedance over the whole traces that you're routing. Otherwise, you will get, uh, uh, get into troubles. Uh, PCI Express is routed as differential pair signals, which means you have a positive and a negative uh, signal uh, which is routed in parallel and they're having or should have 90 ohm of differential impedance between each other. The SD card on the other hand is a single-ended signal 
which means uh, it's just one signal. And this signal should have a 50 ohm uh, impedance, but since uh, the speed is quite lower, it is not that uh, problematic if you're not reaching this uh, resistance. It's more like a trade-off that you have to find. Really interesting is also when you compare these two interfaces, the length uh, skew that is allowed, so the length difference that is allowed. And you look at the PCI Express, within that diff pair, within uh, this positive and negative part of the signal, you have to have a really, really uh, precise length matching of just 150 micrometers. It's really important to keep it. But on the other hand, between uh, a diff pair and the clock signals, or a diff pair and another diff pair, it is really relaxed. So you can have more up to 240 millimeters of length difference. This is due to the fact how PCI Express is built. On the other hand, the SD card is there uh, more restricted. So you have to have shorter uh, maximum length differences between them. But as well, it again depends on uh, the actual speeds of the interface you're running. In our design guide, you found also some additional information to uh, how many uh, AC coupling you need in the interfaces or whether there are some restrictions to bias, uh, etc. Diego already mentioned the layer stack up, especially when it comes to uh, impedance controlled uh, routing. You have to think about the layer stack up, about the geometry of your uh, PCB. Uh, when you look at the PCB uh, stack up on the right side, here you find uh, some, uh, some layers which are used for power and some for, play, uh, for ground. And you can see there are some inner layers for which you can use to route signals as well as the bottom top layer. It may look like it would be good to route high speed signals in the inner layers here since it's perfectly shielded by the power plane as well as the ground plane. But the actual the impedance of a signal, it always depends on the reference you have of a signal. When you look at layer 3, for example, the reference of layer 3 is layer 2 as well as layer 5. And as you can see, the distance to these reference layers are really big, which means in order to get a 50 ohm or 90 ohm differential pair impedance, the, your traces need to be really, really thick. It's not even doable here, so they get so thick. So therefore, it is recommended here in this layer stack up to root on the top or bottom layer. I even recommend more to root delicate signals on the top uh, bottom layer, because there you have ground as reference. Well, you can use the power plane as reference for high-speed signal, but you have to be more careful. When it comes to uh, calculating the actual uh, impedance of uh, signal traces, I recommend you to work close with your PCB manufacturer, because he knows exactly what is doable and how you can reach a cheap and, and easy to produce PCB and not do the crazy stuff which can hardly be uh, produced. So we're close with it. They have all the tools to do the whole calculation. Uh, the last slide I have uh, to the whole layout thing uh, is about a lot of rules uh, that you find for doing layout. So you find a lot of do's and downs of hints how you should do uh, layouting in our design guide. So please go to our design guide and have a look there. You find a lot of inputs, what you should do, what you should not do. But as it is always with layout, it is never black and white. So there are always rules which uh, kind of you sometimes need to break in order to do a design. It's just a trade-off uh, which rules you should follow. It is kind of you have to get a feeling about these kind of rules. You might find in other um, documents from experts some additional rules or rules that even tell you something different. Again, 
it is not really a black and white uh, theory in which everything is good and bad, so there are always uh, things between. So that's all I can say right now in this short time about layering. I would like now to open the question and answer session. Uh, feel free to type in uh, some questions if you haven't done it so far. First question I got is, uh, is there a free Altium viewer available for viewing Tordex files? Uh, yes, there is. You actually can download a free viewer at the Altium website. So even if you use a different uh, PCB uh, tool, you can use it in order to open the Tordex files and have an input how it is done. Do I need an impedance controlled PCB for a carrier board, Colibri carrier board, if I use just USB 2 and fast Ethernet? Well, if you do just a Colibri, uh, a Colibri carrier board, it may be possible to use a standard PCB which you don't do any, uh, any uh, P, uh, impedance control. It is mainly depending how long the traces are on your carrier board. So if you have really short USB or Ethernet uh, traces on your carrier board, then you can maybe just have a design in which you do not have any correct impedances. But I recommend it. If you have the possibility, calculate the correct width uh, and try to route them as good as possible. Is there any QT supported, supported and how it is supported? Uh, yes, we do have QT support. We were close with the Qt uh, company. Uh, there is actually also a webinar on our website which uh, is together with uh, the Qt company in which we explain how ac actually the, uh, uh, the collaboration between Toradex and Qt is done. Next questions, are there any modules available for industrial temperature range? Uh, yes, we do have a lot of our modules are also available in uh, the extended uh, temperature range, which means minus 40 up to 85 degrees Celsius. Uh, but you have to be also always uh, careful with your cooling solution that you may need if it goes to higher temperature. Can I use a standard off-the-shelf carrier board for volume projects like Iris or Viola? Uh, yes, you can use these kind of boards if everything fits to your needs, but very often there is a connector uh, not on the correct side or you, you're missing some additional features. So you have, should have now learned in this uh, webinar how easy it is to use the Viola or Iris as a boilerplate for your own little design in which you can just do uh, to adopt it to uh, exactly your needs. We have, we have used 100 units of Viola and VF50 combination in our product. Now we want to make a carrier board that makes more IOS, so is there a way Toradex can help you with it? Uh, yes, I mean we can help you to support doing this uh, design. Uh, like the things that I have presented or we have presented today. If you are searching more like uh, that you want to uh, let us do the uh, whole design, then I must say we are not doing it on ourselves, but we have uh, a wide list or a big list of uh, network partners, which means we have a network of other companies uh, who are working close with us, which we can provide you, uh, so they can help you to do a design for you. Do we have to buy license for Windows? Since Trend is moving towards HTML, HTML technologies, well, uh, included in the uh, the modules you're selling from Toradex is always the Windows CE license, so you don't have to care about uh, the licensing of the Windows CE or 
now called uh, Windows Embedded Compact. So this is included. Can I use uh, the Pinout Designer for comparing module features? Uh, yes, you can use it actually. You can use it as uh, in order to compare uh, different modules. But be always aware that you should also read the uh, data sheet of the modules and check uh, whether there are some other limitations or some interfaces because uh, the pinout design is not always uh, able to tell you the every detail of an interface. Which OS is installed on the modules? Uh, it depends right now. I mean, uh, the modules that are selling in high volumes, they are normally equipped with uh, the Windows CE. Uh, there are some modules like the Vibrate and the iMix 6, they are currently uh, uh, pre-installed with Linux. The reason for that is that uh, the, our Windows CE image is not uh, as ready as the uh, the Linux one, so we will provide for the, in the beginning here the Linux, and later on they will be equipped also with uh, Windows C right from start. Why is the routing of an LVDS interface more complicated than routing an HDMI interface? This is a really good question since, uh, as you can see, HDMI is, is going to a higher uh, higher speed than actually LVDS normally does. But even though uh, this is like that, the LVDS is more tricky to root. The reason for that is that the LVDS is really a dump uh, interface. It doesn't have any uh, kind of uh, uh, embedded clock or, or uh, any uh, check whether the signal is arriving. So uh, therefore the LVDS interface, for example, need to be uh, really precise when it comes to to the length between the different uh, signal pairs. So there can be quite tricky to root. Uh, while the HDMI is more robust when it comes to this, it allows more uh, length differences between the different signal pairs. Can I use the Altium uh, for calculating the trace impedances? Well, Altium has a kind of an impedance calculator built in, but it is not really accurate. I really recommend you to use a different calculator. Uh, a very well known is the Polar calculator. Uh, unfortunately, it is not a free one. So if you don't have this tool, I recommend to work close with your PCB manufacturer because he probably has this tool and is willing to help you uh, doing whole calculations there. When will be the Windows Embedded Compact 2013 available on the on all of the Apalis modules? Uh, this is a really good question for a hardware design guy. So uh, it is hard to tell me for me to give you this information. So probably it's best if you write uh, to the uh, support team short question to support.arm at toradex.com, so he will, they will be able to answer this question. Next one, do you have a layout design rule? Well, we have the layout design guide, as I, tell you, I told you, you find there are a lot of rules. Uh, as I also said, layouting is never black and white, so there are sometimes, you find sometimes other rules uh, some experts tell you some other uh, information. It is not that we are wrong or they are wrong, it is just sometimes uh, it's somewhere in the middle. So layouting is something, yeah, kind of, uh, it's always the compromise between different rules. Uh, is there a free Altium viewer label for viewing the Toradex files? Uh, yes, there is. There is. Uh, go to the Altium uh, website, you will be able to download a free viewer there. So you can use it, if you use a different uh, design tool, you can at least open the, uh, the schematic and as well the, uh, uh, the layout designs to see what is going on. If you want to add a second Ethernet interface, 
uh, to Viola, can we do that? Well, first of all, the second Ethernet uh, interface required an uh, external PHY, which means you need to have an external board with the PHY on it. For test purposes, uh, it should be possible as far as I know. Uh, you can check that out. Uh, whether the signals are available on the Viola. So what you can do is load configuration, uh, load the, uh, the Viola carrier board in it. So it takes a while. Now it is loaded. Now we can go to the Ethernet. But what we can do now is uh, checking whether these signals are actually somewhere available uh, since the Viola does not have every signal available. So what we can do here is to use this pin filter function. We were not talking before about this function. It actually allows you to say which pins you want to actually, or uh, to filter out pins that are not available. So I can select only the pins that are also available externally. This is already preset. If you load the uh, Viola configuration, this is already preset. So what you have to do is to enable this, uh, this filter. So I enable it. So you can now see only the pins that are actually also available on some uh, pinouts, uh, on some headers. So what you can do now and check whether these pins on the Ethernet are available. So we can open it up and it seems to be that there is the only one I'm missing is the clock out. So the clock out is not missing. So uh, no, you cannot do it with the viola. So what you have to do is to take the viola as a reference design and adding it uh, directly on your own one. So there you can do it. So you can use the viola starting point, but you cannot use the viola directly to use the second Ethernet right now. Can you do a review over, of our own carrier board design? Uh, well, we sometimes do it, but uh, it, it, you need to uh, pay for that because it's not included in our standard support service. So we can help you with this, but uh, uh, yeah, it, it really depends how we see that. Uh, it's it's also good to go to the partner websites and to see whether they can help you with it. Can I do a Colibri carrier board with a two-layer PCB? Well, this can be quite tricky to do. Uh, it is theoretically possible, especially if you don't need a lot of interfaces, and especially when you don't need a USB or or Ethernet on it, so you have just uh, some low-speed interface, then it is doable, but probably it is easier to do it with a four-layer PCB in which you have proper power and ground uh, uh, connection to the module. Uh, while designing the carrier board from any PCB manufacturer, what are the points that we should keep in mind to get the product right? Are there any difference? between an industrial and a military-grade PCB? Uh, so there are actually two questions here. Uh, so when you choose your PC manufacturer, what you should keep in mind is uh, what he is able to do. What are is its uh, kind of design rules that you have to follow? There are many PCB manufacturers available which can only do up to, let's say, uh, 300 micrometer drilling of vias or only down to 150 micrometers of, uh, of trace width. So uh, if you have to use a small trace width, then you have, of course, to select a PC manufacturer that is able to do that. Then, uh, I mean, PCB manufacturing is also kind of a relationship that you have to know each other. So. Uh, so you have to get, have a good feeling with them, whether they're, especially when it comes, a good, good thing is, for example, when you talk with them about stack up, you will see uh, really fast how good they are, how, how 
how easy they are, whether they are able to, to help you with this kind of part. Yeah. What is the difference between uh, industrial and military grade PCB? Well, military grade, military grade uh, PCBs, military grade means very often also uh, a different temperature range, um, some more robustness. I must say I don't have a lot of uh, experience in this part, so uh, uh, if you write me an email, I may be able to uh, to check that. Which uh, Apalis module is better, better suited for supporting two Ethernet ports, the Apalis T30 or the Apalis IMX6? Well, actually, there is not a really big difference when it comes to here. So for the Apalis, if you want to have a second Ethernet, you have to use uh, either the PC Express, especially if you want to have a gigabit Ethernet, or maybe you can also use the USB instead. Since on the uh, Apalis T30 we are already have on the module uh, PC Express to gigabit Ethernet uh, controller on it, it makes probably more sense to use it there because then you have twice the same system while on the Apalis IMX6 we have a built-in Mac for the first Ethernet so then the second one will be a, again an external one on the PC Express so there you have two kind of different uh, things. So at the end it's not a big difference between T30 and Apalis IMX6 when it comes to second Ethernet. I just got one last question, so maybe we can answer that as well. Uh, the WEA50 module is less on memory. Is there a way to add an EMMC in order to increase the memory? Uh, yes, there is the possibility. Uh, EMMC is actually is uh, using the SD card interface. Uh, since we have more than one SD card interface on the VF50 uh, module, you can actually use one of them to add uh, an additional EMMC on the board. Uh, but what I must say is that you're not able to boot from this external EMMC. Uh, you will always need to boot from the internal flash that we provide on the module. But you can use it as a, for additional uh, additional storage. Uh, well, also, uh, when it comes to the uh, SD card, you can see actually we also have up to, uh, let me deselect here now the IMX6 uh, in order to see, well, actually on the uh, Vibrate you only have 4-bit, not 8-bit SD card, but this is not a problem. Uh, since all the EMMC is backward compatible to 4 bits, so you can use it, you will have just a bit a lower speed then. Do all the Tordex products are tested for EMI EMC? Uh, yes and no. So as a module manufacturer, we can actually not really test just the module. So EMC test means always you have to test a complete system including uh, the, the carrier board, including housing, including additional uh, peripherals. So that's the reason why we cannot really test uh, your system. You can only test uh, our Colibri modules together with one of our carrier boards. So what we are doing is uh, we are going into a test chamber with uh, some of our modules with some of our carrier boards in order to see whether it is possible to pass EMC test. But at the end, the uh, EMC test is something that is up to you as a system designer since you only have the complete system. What will be more reliable, either a removable COM or an onboard module? That's actually a good question. <laughs> I mean, when it comes to reliability, of course, when you have an additional connector between the uh, computer module and uh, the carrier board, it can introduce some additional uh, kind of reliability issues. But what we have seen so far is 
that uh, there are not really many problems when it comes to this part. So uh, it also depends how actually you mount the module. Uh, you can mount uh, Colibri as well as the Apalis modules also with screws so it, uh, it does not fall, down, fall out uh, when you drop it. So we have actually uh, customers using it in really harsh environment, military environment, as well as an automotive environment. So yes, you can use uh, computer or modules in such environments, but of course uh, when you do uh, design in, it will be more reliable when it comes to vibration, etc. But yeah, maybe less uh, due to the fact that we are able to do more maintain maintenance on our modules. So there we have a benefit. So uh, I thank you all for listening to the webinar. I hope we were able to give you some new inputs. I uh, hope you have learned something and hopefully we'll see you at the uh, uh, support uh, team. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask our support staff. So thank you for listening and have a good day.